Well, hey, what's up? How are you? Welcome to Crime Dive. My name is Crystal Sky, and if you're anything like me, you find yourself drawn to true crime cases. So yeah, that's what I talk about. If you like true crime, and you want to feel better about your own makeup skills, you should absolutely like, subscribe, and come hang out with me every Tuesday where I take a deep dive look into a true crime case while slapping on my war paint. I can't believe it's the end of February already. Where's this year going? Although if I'm going to be honest, this year's going a lot better for me personally than last year. I hope the same goes for you. Now, today's case is a very interesting one that I have uh, really wanted to talk about because uh, it is about Nathan Luthold, the missionary turned murderer. And I wanted to cover this case because Cases like this always really sort of fascinate and draw to me. Cases of great hypocrisy, irony, whatever you want to call it. Whenever it's someone who is like a doctor or in the healthcare profession or like today's case, a self-professed man of God or being super religious, and then they commit the ultimate, you know, sin and act – murdering, like taking a human life. So it always really fascinates me. And it fascinates me to hear these people just explain their actions or try to explain away their actions. Like, it's just fascinating, just the mental gymnastics these people go through. And yeah, that is what we have in this case. And it was super fascinating and wanted to talk about it. I uh, usually give disclaimers. Um, like with last week, uh, I think you're good. There's nothing too gruesome or detailed or anything. Um, so you should be good. So without further ado, let's get into today's case. The case of Nathan Luthold, the missionary turned murderer. Now, we're actually not going to start with Nathan. We're actually going to start with Denise L. Newton. All right. Now, Denise, she was born February 3rd, 1974 in Dade County, Florida. Her parents are Doug and Diane Newton. Now, I don't know a whole lot about uh, Denise's upbringing or childhood. There is actually, I think it was a Dateline episode about this case. Unfortunately, I could not find anywhere online to watch the full episode. All I was able to see were clips and they were just of Nathan. So maybe in the Dateline episode, they go into more detail, but um, couldn't find much information on her upbringing. But yeah, I found, found a few things that uh, such as she graduated from Faith Baptist Christian School in Pekin, Illinois in 1992. And she was also a member of the LaMarche Baptist Church located in Mapleton, Illinois. She was described as a pretty, like, kind of quiet, reserved type of person. She had that kind of personality. She was someone who really prided herself on, like, her family and her family life. She really wanted to be a mother. And on July 15th, 1995, Denise would marry her husband, Nathan Andrew Luthold. And it was said that Denise knew Nathan since uh, they were in the third grade. And yeah, so they were married. And uh, again, like with Denise, not a whole lot of info about Nathan's upbringing per se, but uh, there were a few things that you can find out, such as he was born sometime in 1976. I couldn't find his exact birthday. Really weird. His parents are Bruce and Catherine Luthold, and he has a sister named Abigail Patton. Now, Nathan was described as like a very logical person, someone who really enjoyed planning and doing large projects. He was an avid baseball fan, was a hunter, and he was described as friends as sort of like that stereotypical male in that he avoided showing emotions at all time. Friends described Nathan as a, quote, very logical person, someone who was in control of his emotions. Now, Denise and Nathan marry, and they end up having three children, a son and two daughters. The son they named Seth, and the two daughters they named Julie and Janelle. Now, at the time, 
of the events of this case, Seth is about 12, Julia is about 10, and Janelle is only about 4. Now, uh, the Luthholds were uh, very, very involved in their church. Uh, Nathan and Denise were both members of La, of La Marche Baptist Church, and they were actually both missionaries for the church. Yeah, they did, like, official missionary work, and this enabled them to travel all across the world. They traveled abroad, and one of the places that they ended up traveling to and would end up traveling to quite a bit was the country of Lithuania. They went there beginning in about 1998, and yeah, they would go there frequently. It is said that the couple, um, they both spoke the language, though it is said that Nathan was much more like fluent and comfortable compared to Denise. And yeah, they would go to Lithuania quite often. They even lived there for a period of time. I don't know if it was just one period of time or like multiple times, but they did live there. And uh, at some point in 1999, Nathan and Denise, they met a six-year-old Lithuanian girl named Aina Dobolate. Dobolate. I'm going to assume that is how her last name is pronounced. Again, relying on Google, good old Google. So that is what it said. Aina Dobolate. And her and her mother, Inga, they uh, they were also members of the church. Um, I'm guessing the church was probably, since they did missionary work all around the world, they probably had, like, branches all around the world. And, yeah, Ina and her mother, Inga, were members of the church. And that is how Ina met the Luthholds. And it is said that she became quite close with the family. So, yeah, Ina and her mother, said, grows close to the Luthholds over time. And now let's jump forward to about 2010 or so, all right? Ina is like 17, 18 years old, and the Luthholds actually sponsor her student visa to the United States. She was interested in studying ministry work and music, and it is said that the Luthholds were her sponsor. Well, specifically Nathan Luthold. It was only his name on Ina's uh, sponsorship paperwork. So she comes to the United States and she first attends a school in Pensacola, Florida from about 2010 through December of 2011. Now, this school that Ina attended, it was a private religious school. And uh, rumor has it that Ina was uh, actually booted from the school. Um, so Ina and Nathan, they would be seen hanging out together off campus. Yeah, Nathan was coming to Florida to visit Ina, and they were doing stuff together, you know, just activities, fun stuff, including staying in hotels together. Yeah. And uh, seeing as this is a private religious school, they, uh, of course, were... Not too uh, fond of the, the optics of this. And it is said that uh, they booted Ina. But I also read that she actually withdrew from the school before they could officially boot her so her academic credits would transfer. So after Ina attends school in Florida, she heads up to Illinois, to Peora, Illinois, to attend Illinois Central College. And Peora is where Nathan and Denise are also staying. Yeah, they're staying there as well. And so while Ina is in Peora, she hangs out with the Lufholtz some more. She watches their children, teaches them piano lessons. She had been um, watching the children for quite some time, um, starting in like her junior, senior years of high school, when when the Luthholds lived in Lithuania, she would watch the children. She is said to have taught the family Lithuanian. She worked on like translations for the church and Nathan and doing that kind of stuff. So yeah, she had watched the children for quite some time. And when she was up in Peora to go to college, she also babysat them. So yeah, by 2013, Ina uh, was attending school in Chicago, and she was actually living on her own. Though, um, it is said that she did maintain a uh, close relationship with the Luthholds. Well, with Nathan Luthold. Yeah. Now, interestingly enough, you know, so 2013, she's living in Chicago on her own. Um, Nathan is said to have been paying her living expenses. Yeah. I also read a report that Nathan's parents were paying her living expenses. Um, but either way, the Luthholds are paying for Ina's, you know, living expenses and her day-to-day -day necessities. So that's a little weird. Um, if that didn't raise your eyebrow... 
Um, Nathan and Ina, like they had done in Florida, they hung out together quite often, quite often doing all kinds of fun activities, including, get this, going on trips to Europe together. It is said they went during the summers of 2011 and 2012, and allegedly the two were seen uh, cuddled up quite cozily on one of the flights. They also went uh, to a shooting range together, horseback riding, shopping. They were even seen browsing apartments uh, in Chicago. So yeah, just doing all kinds of fun stuff together. Now, I'm sure you uh, are asking the same thing that I am. Where was Denise during these activities? Well, she was nowhere to be around. Yeah, she was nowhere to be found. It was always just Nathan and Ina. And to add further you know, further speculation to this whole setup. Uh, Nathan and Ina were also on a joint bank account together that Nathan made deposits into. Yeah, and it was just Nathan. Denise was not on this bank account. Now, Ina says that uh, the only reason it was Nathan's name on the account and not Nathan and Denise is because, like, you know, uh, Nathan was her her sponsor and it was because of her immigration status and her difficulty speaking English. It was just easier to have Nathan on uh, on the account with her. Now, I'm sure... Um, the optics of this are not looking great, right? They're not looking great. I'm sure you're thinking what I was thinking when I uh, was researching this. Like, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. They are definitely having an affair because, uh, yeah, I can tell you this. If Jeff was uh, doing even half of these fun things with another woman um, without me, there would be um, there'd be some problems. All right. Now, even Nathan's own friends kind of noticed that uh, Nathan and Ina spent quite a bit of time together. And uh, these are his friends in like the church community. And uh, they did ask him about it. And he just kind of brushed it off. And uh, it uh, the optics were so bad that uh, the church's uh, pastor, Pastor David Sexton, I'm unclear as if, uh, if he's the current pastor, but at the time of this case... Uh, he was the pastor. And uh, he had seen Nathan and Ina hanging out together. He'd seen them driving around together without Denise. And uh, he straight up confronted Nathan and Denise and was just like, what is up with all this? Like, what's up with this? This doesn't look good. Um, he was not He was not too thrilled at the thought of uh, members of his flock openly sinning. You know what I mean? Like, he, he didn't like the optics at all. He, he it was upset him greatly. And he even threatened to um, pretty much fire the Luthholds from their missionary work. Uh, the Luthholds got about $5,000 a month for their missionary work for the church. And uh, yeah, the, the pastor was threatening to pretty much withdraw it. So like, I took that to mean he would have just fired them, you know? And yeah, he was just, he was not happy about it. Now, it is important to note that uh, both Nathan and Ina, to this day, to this day, deny any type of affair, anything uh, shady going on. Uh, Ina has said that Nathan was just her, quote, mentor and employer. And uh, Nathan just explains that, like, hey, the only reason I was with um, Ina all the time was that she didn't have a driver's license. She didn't speak English all that well. And so I was like her translator and chauffeur. That's why. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So... At approximately 3.15 p.m. on Valentine's Day in 2013, uh, Nathan, who's 37 at this point, and he has called up 911. He says there's been a break-in at his in-law's house in Peora, Illinois. So, you see, Nathan and Denise, who's 39, they are currently living with Denise's parents. It is uh, unclear how long Denise and Nathan had been staying with her parents. Uh, and they had, I think they had just gotten back for, from some uh, missionary work. So unclear as to how long they were staying there or what exactly the plan was. But yeah, they had been living with her parents for a, a little bit. Um, so it was uh, Nathan, Denise, her parents, and the three children. And on this day on Valentine's Day, yeah, Nathan called 911 to report there had been a break-in. So he said that he hadn't been um, able to get a hold of Denise all day. She wasn't answering her phone and her texts. And uh, the, like, kindergarten daycare thing that they dropped their four-year-old off, uh, Janelle, at, they had called him. 
and had said, hey, your wife has not picked up uh, Janelle. She dropped her off at about 12.20 p.m. that day, but hadn't been back to pick her up. And uh, Nathan said that he got worried. And on his way to pick up Janelle, he decided to swing by the house and see what was up, like why she wasn't answering. And that is when he saw the garage door open, which was unusual, and there was glass on the ground from a broken window. And that is when Nathan, without entering the home, immediately dialed 911. Now, allegedly, uh, on the 911 call, Nathan is said to uh, kind of like be stuttering a lot, uh, as if he's not quite sure what to say. So officers are dispatched, and uh, one of the first officers to arrive on scene is Officer Richard Linthicum. And he says when he pulled up on scene, Nathan was standing across the street. Now, not long after uh, Officer Linthicum arrived, another officer arrived, and that's when the two entered the Luthold residence. And that is when they find Denise dead on the floor from a single gunshot wound to the head. Her glasses were several feet away. Her coat was halfway on. A bifold door that was uh, near her was ripped off its hinges. They found a bullet tangled in her hair along with her car keys. She had been killed by a single gunshot wound by a 40 Glock. And coincidentally, Nathan, he owned three firearms, one of which was a 40 Glock. And as soon as the officers stumble upon Denise's body, they immediately exit the house, radio for back, back up, back up. I was going to say back up, back up, radio for backup, get out their bulletproof shields, draw their weapons and wait for their backup to arrive. During all of this, during all of this, them storming out of the home and getting all their gear ready, it is said that Nathan did not approach the officers once. He did not ask a single question, didn't say anything, just stood there and watched. Like, I don't know about you, but I know if that was me, I would be demanding like, oh my, what'd you find out? Like, you better tell me what the hell you just found out. You know, like, I'd be freaking out. Um, but not Nathan. Nathan was, um, yeah, didn't, uh, didn't ask anything. Now, Officer Lithicum, he also noted that, uh, on per, on, upon, like, first inspection of the scene, it did look like a robbery, um, but once you really looked at it, like really took it all in and what you were looking at, it was a very unusual robbery, if it was one. So he said that there were electronics in the living room that hadn't been touched. There were two very large jar jars of change that hadn't been touched. $300 was found in a dresser, like pretty easily, just kind of laying on top. A 50 and a 20 was still in Denise's wallet. And stranger still was the kitchen had uh, had been touched by the robbers, which I guess evidently is very rare in a home invasion robbery, you know, because they're usually just going to hit like the bedrooms and try to get valuable stuff, right? And uh, it's very unusual for the kitchen to be touched at all. So not only was the kitchen touched, the kitchen drawers had been pulled out and placed on the floor, not thrown, placed on the floor. But that was it. Like the kitchen table and the chairs and like everything else was was in order. And that was immediately weird to the officers because that's just that's just not how normal robberies um, happen. You know what I mean? Now, even though they didn't really think this had been a robbery, they did note that there were some items missing from the home, uh, a camera, a computer, some jewelry, and two of Nathan's firearms, including his 40 Glock. In the bedroom closet, officers found a black sweatshirt that they believed contained gunshot residue. And later on, it would be found out that uh, the right cuff of that sweatshirt did have gunshot residue on it, either from being in close proximity from a firearm being discharged or coming in contact with something that had gunshot residue on it. They did find a muddy shoe print uh, by the back door, uh, right above where the glass had been broken, above the knob. And there was uh, an identified fingerprint found on the jewelry box. And that jewelry box is where some of the jewelry had been taken from. Now, after officers had secured the scene, Officer Linthicum went back outside, uh, you know, to talk to Nathan. But he wasn't there anymore. So uh, the officer went to uh, the neighbor across the street. That was the house that Nathan had been standing in front of that whole time. And knocked on the door, and that's where Nathan was. 
Officer Linthicum wanted to talk to him because they had discovered that Denise's car was missing, that it had been stolen. And so they wanted to get uh, that information from Nathan. And so Nathan gave it to him and then the officer just left. Nathan had not asked the officer a single question, not a single one. Uh, the officer had just asked for uh, the info on Denise's car and Nathan gave it to him. And like, yeah, the officer just went on his merry way. He didn't ask a single question. I don't know about you, but I would definitely be peppering that fool with questions like, what, what did you find? What do you mean? Why do you need your car information? Like, why aren't you telling me anything? But yeah, that wasn't Nathan. They did end up finding Denise's car pretty nearby. It was at the nearby local park called Robinson Park. They found her SUV there, and uh, they found uh, a glove about 50 yards from the car, and also found the vehicle's keys in one of the trash cans in the park. Now, seeing as Nathan's the husband, he, of course, is prime suspect number one. And they, of course, ask for Nathan's whereabouts that day. And he gives them a list of the places that he had gone and the things that he had done. And so when they go, when officers go to, like, verify his whereabouts and kind of, like, you know, look at the security cam footage, Nathan is there. So, you know, he does have an alibi. But the problem was that... um he was seen on almost every security camera. Like, he was seen a lot. And uh, it actually made the officers suspicious because it made it seem to them that he was, like, trying to be seen on camera, you know? Like, it just, it kind of looked suspicious. Now, even though he had been seen on camera, there was some time that uh, was unaccounted for. So between 11.31 a.m. and 12.45 p.m., Nathan's whereabouts are unknown. He is not on any security cam footage. Um, it is also said that the police thought that Nathan, quote, didn't act right when told of his wife's death. Um, I couldn't find any more elaboration on that. Um, but if his behavior is any indicator of how he acted when they discovered her body, yeah, that would be kind of suspicious. Like, I get people grieve in different ways, but come on. Like, to not ask any questions or, like, what was going on, especially when you called 911 because you said you were worried about your wife. Like, come on. A friend of the family and a fellow missionary named William Harper, he said that uh, him and his family actually stayed with Nathan uh, a week after Denise's funeral. And he did know that that was the first time he ever saw Nathan cry or show any type of emotion. Um, he just said that Nathan just went on and on about how much the, the children were going to miss their mother, especially the girls who were really looking forward to doing things with their mother and how this was affecting his work and his time off, how it was going to affect the children's schooling and, you know, on and on and on. Though William did notice and, and note that um, never once did Nathan say how much he was going to miss Denise or how her death was going to affect him and how much he was going to miss her or anything like that, which he thought was a little weird. Now, Nathan had theorized that someone had broken into the home and had murdered Denise in the commission of a robbery. Now, a few days before Denise's murder, Nathan had called the local police to report a, quote, suspicious vehicle that was uh, parked across his house. And then he said that it had pulled into his driveway with their headlights off and then driven away. When an officer was dispatched uh, to the scene, he couldn't find any suspicious vehicle. And when he told Nathan that perhaps he should go door to door and interview Nathan's neighbors, and see if they had seen the suspicious vehicle, Nathan would just like brush it off. He's like, no, no, don't bother him with this. It's, it's fine. It's fine. Nathan was ultimately arrested on March 6th, less than a month after his wife's murder for first degree murder. The prosecution and uh, the investigators were saying that not only did Nathan murder his wife in order to continue a relationship with his girlfriend, but uh, now this was kind of dramatic, but that he murdered Denise as a Valentine's Day present for his girlfriend. Again, that's what the prosecution was alleging. And on July 14th, 2014, Nathan's trial began. He was prosecuted by prosecutor Judy Hughes and uh, also by state's attorney Jerry Brady. And Nathan was defended by attorney Hugh Toner. Now, Nathan's trial was actually a pretty big deal for the area because uh, this was the first trial that uh, the broad use of like cameras and, and media were uh, were allowed. Now, uh, the 10th Judicial Circuit had recently ruled that uh, you could use, like, media for, like, live minute-by-minute -minute updates of the courtroom, uh, 
reporters were allowed to like, you know, tweet live to uh, minute to minute, like updates and stuff like that. Because all across the country, there are different rules in different jurisdictions when it comes to covering trials as far as like media and reporters are concerned. And for the 10th Judicial Circuit, this was the first trial where this much media and cameras and just photographs and just everything were allowed to occur. So it was kind of a big deal for the area. And this was also the first major trial in Peora County to also use this much like coverage in media. So because of that, it was a pretty big deal for the area. Now, the prosecution, they presented a slew of evidence, a slew of evidence, although, to be fair, much of it was circumstantial. And now I'm going to uh, list the evidence that they presented, and you can decide if uh, it's just too circumstantial, and that's all it is, or if it's one of those things where, like, there's enough circumstantial evidence that it sort of takes on, you know, where there's smoke, there's fire. So you decide. So one of the things that the prosecution um, brought as evidence was several text messages between Nathan and Denise and between Nathan and Ina in the monks, monks, months, weeks, and days leading up to the murder. And the prosecution noted, Nathan and Ina certainly texted and communicated way more often than Nathan did with his own wife. And not just that, but uh, that the texts between Nathan and uh, Denise were more, quote, business-like, whereas the text messages between Nathan and Ina were more, quote, loose and relaxed, even flirtatious. So let me give you one exchange that the prosecution presented. And um, yeah, you you tell me if it's a little, little suspicious. So there was one exchange where uh, Nathan, or Ina, had uh, texted Nathan that she was going to the gym. And Nathan replied back, you know, quote, without me, with a smiley face emoticon. And later on, when Ina was done, and texting Nathan that she was done, he asks her if she is, quote, wet, with a smiley face emoticon and that he went, then he went on, told her how beautiful she was and how she quote smelled good with another smiley face emoticon. He also said, you are so beautiful with another smiley face emoticon. This dude in the emoticons, like I don't understand, like a lot of the exchange of him had a bunch of these stupid emoticons. Other messages between them just invoked like religion and like, like scripture and whatnot. And, um, yeah, I can tell you that, uh, if, uh, Jeff was, uh, texting anything even remotely like that with another woman, yeah, again, we would be, we'd be having problems. We'd be having a different conversation. They also presented text messages, uh, between Nathan and Ina the morning of the murder. So after exchanging, uh, morning hellos, Nathan had texted Ina, quote, I know there's a lot to do today. I pray that there's enough time to do everything. Have good lectures and meaning, nether smiley face. Take care of yourself. And this was sent at 8.37 a.m. the morning of Denise's murder. Also, when Nathan was across the street, when officers were swarming the house, he was, you guessed it, texting Ina. And he had texted her that there had been a, quote, break-in at the house. And Ina responded with, quote, interesting, with a smiley face emoticon. The prosecution also presented evidence. Of course, it's just not a day without cat hair. The prosecution also presented recorded conversations between Nathan and Ina that they had had while he was uh, locked behind bars awaiting trial. In these conversations, uh, Nathan was just like telling Ina like about the relationship, telling her to tell everyone how she was accepted by Denise's family. And Ina is seen writing down everything Nathan is telling her. He also told her that the only reason his name was on her sponsorship paperwork and not Denise was because Denise's name wouldn't fit along with his. And that's why. He also said, as far as the insurance company was concerned, Ina was his dependent. In one 15 to 20 minute recorded conversation, uh, Nathan is, yeah, her just like telling Ina like how the relationship evolved, what they had done and, you know, stuff like that. Like it was very much in a way of like telling her what to say without 
straight up saying like, hey, tell them this, you know? He was telling her, yeah, like, you were accepted by family. Denise only trusted you with the kids. You were in her daily prayers. She got you gifts. And yeah, everything was just totally peachy. In another conversation, he's heard saying, quote, tell them I'm a spiritual advisor. Tell them I am clergy because no one here can speak Lithuanian for you. And I think this was in an attempt to get like these conversations thrown out as evidence. Like, you know, when you like confess to a priest or whatever, it's like privileged. I think that's what he was trying to do there. He was also recorded telling her that the reason they frequented a spa together, and it was just them, was because, yeah, of her immigration status, because uh, no one else could translate. And he had to uh, chauffeur her around because she didn't have a license. And he paid using the uh, bank account they had together. Uh, the spa, they frequented quite often. It was called the Five Senses Spa. And yeah, this was just one of those things that they uh, did together without Denise. The prosecutors also submitted emails, deleted emails between Nathan and Ina that, um, yeah, were pretty, um, pretty difficult to paint as uh, platonic friends talking to each other, you know? There was one email sent in January of 2013, so just a month before Denise's murder. And I want to read it to you because you tell me if this is um, just two friends talking to each other or if this is two lovers communicating with each other. Because again, remember, Nathan is denying any type of an affair. So I'll be looking down a little bit, so bear with me. So it read, quote, I let you down, and I'm sorry. I'm not going to make excuses. That would not be fair to you. You do, you deserve someone who respects you and puts the relationship first. And from now on, I want to do everything I can to be that person. There is nothing more important to me than you and this relationship. I am so blessed to have you in my life. And I know it. Yeah, again, um, if... Jeff was texting anything remotely like that with another woman, we'd be having problems. I don't know how you can paint that as platonic friends communicating with each other, but whatever. Other emails, um, you know, on top of like invoking like scripture and religion also talked about like, like glee at the fact that Ina was a surrogate mother to his children and just stuff like that. Though the murder weapon was never found, uh, the prosecution did submit into evidence a uh, search of Nathan's laptop, USB drive and hard drive. And in it, they found over 1,700 deleted searches, 30 of which specifically dealt with trading Iraqi currency and the best ways to kill someone. These searches had been made in the weeks and days leading up to Denise's death. They included things such as how to silence a 40 Glock, uh, what happens to a non-diabetic when they're injected with insulin, uh, the best ways to kill someone how to kill someone via electrocution or injection, methods of suicide, specifically, quote, the best ways to die by suicide, information on the date rape jug, GHB, and the searches just went on and on like this. Yeah, pretty damning. Now, Hugh Toner, Nathan's defense attorney, he countered this evidence by pointing out that, well, Nathan's laptop and his hard drives, they weren't password protected. So anyone could have researched this information. Anyone could have searched for it. And uh, he said, quote, why would he do that? I think the internet searches are like a bad thought, except if you do the search, it's out there forever. But I just thought it was a weird statement to make because it's like, okay, so what are you saying? That someone else made those searches or that Nathan did those searches and it was like a, quote, bad thought? Like, I just thought that was kind of weird. On the third day of the trial, the prosecution called Ina herself to the stand. I know, drums. Now, uh, they had given her immunity and you're probably asking yourself, like, immunity from what? Well... There was speculation on how much Ina knew of Nathan's plans to murder Denise. There was speculation, um, specifically because of that text exchange that I told you about earlier. Um, people were wondering how much she knew. 
So in exchange for her testimony, she was granted immunity from anything she said. So Ina was called to the stand, and uh, she seemed to begrudgingly answer the prosecutor's questions, specifically the really uncomfortable ones. And um, her whole testimony was described as, quote, tense. And uh, while she was on the stand under oath, she again denied any type of an affair relationship with Nathan, denied ever telling him that she loved him or that he loved her, denied it all. She uh, reiterated all the activities her and Nathan did together and did confirm that Denise was not with them when they did these activities. And her explanation was just like, oh, well, Denise didn't really like to speak Lithuanian. She didn't speak it that well. And she didn't like to speak it in general. So that's why it was just, you know, Ina and Nathan, because she needed a translator. She didn't speak English that well. Now, Ina's testimony was partially told through a tr- court-provided translator. Uh, she spoke in Lithuanian, and the other half was in English from her. So when she started out, she was using the court uh, translator and a court-provided translator, and um, she was clearly getting frustrated with the translator, like having to often correct them and whatnot. And even Nathan himself was visibly frustrated. And at one point, he even interjected himself and was like, Your Honor, can I be the translator? Like, for what? You're the defendant, you idiot. No, you can't be the translator. And like, Judge, Judge Kevin Lyons uh, was overseeing the trial. He told Nathan, no, you know, shut up and sit down. And uh, after that, about, yeah, half of Ina's testimony was her speaking in English. So half of it was through the court-provided translator. And then the latter half was all through Ina in English. Now, you could say, well, maybe she was super nervous to testify and whatnot, you know, and so the frustration and the annoyance with the translator kind of overrode that, and, you know, so she was able to speak English, or it was all BS from the get-go, and she spoke English just fine. Who knows? Uh, The prosecution, uh, they called several witnesses. Uh, One witness they actually called to the stand was the owner of the Five Senses Spa, the spa where Nathan and Ina frequented. Her name was Paola Hinton. Paola, I hope I'm saying that right. Again, relying on Google. Um, But she testified that, yeah, Nathan was always, always at the spa with Ina. Always, always, always. And when Denise would come in, she was always by herself. In fact, she testified she was not even aware that Nathan and Denise were married or were even together. She thought that Nathan and Ina were a couple. They came in together, you know, so often. And then, of course, Nathan's defense, you know, countered this testimony with just reiterating, well, like, you know, she couldn't speak English that well. She didn't have a driver's license. Uh, Nathan could translate for her. So, you know, that was why that was what they clapped back with. Uh, They also clapped back that, uh, you know, Nathan paid with the joint account. So again, that's why he was with her everywhere. And when the prosecution asked Ina about this joint bank account and why Denise wasn't on it, um, yeah, she just said, well, it was Nathan who was her sponsor, okay? It was Nathan who was her sponsor, so that's why it was just Nathan. And yeah, her immigration status and all that just made it easier. The prosecution did also get Ina to admit on the stand that her legal bills were being paid by Nathan's parents. Now, she claimed not to know where these funds were coming from. Turns out those funds were coming from accounts that had been set up for Nathan's children. I know, can you believe that? Ina also admitted on the stand that Nathan's parents had told her not to cooperate with police and not to say anything. Yeah. The prosecution brought in yet another witness. Yeah, they had a lot of witnesses. Now, this was an inmate by the name of David D. Smith. And he's actually serving a 14-year jail sentence on a drug charge. And he testified against Nathan. And he had a deal with the prosecution where his 14-year uh, charge would get reduced down to 10 in exchange for his testimony. So David said that he met Nathan in the Peoria County Jail in March of 2013. So like right after Nathan was arrested. And Nathan had uh, sought him out and asked for like, you know, like legal advice and stuff. And from that point forward, David said that the two would talk for, quote, hours every day. And every time after they were done talking, he would go to his cell and write down everything um, Nathan had told him. 
Now, and this was despite a uh, jail yard handshake the two had, uh, not to rat on each other and not to tell anyone, you know, what they would tell each other. It's like, fool, there, there ain't no honor among thieves. I don't know what this idiot Nathan was, was thinking. I really don't. I don't understand any of these inmates who, like, talk to other inmates about their crimes. Like, fool, no one's in there to, to help you, you know? I just, I don't get it. So David testified that Nathan told him he thought Denise was, quote, overbearing, and he wanted to move on with his life because he had found someone else, someone named, quote, Anna, Lana, or something like that, is what David testified to. He said that uh, Nathan told him the day of the murder, he gave his wife Valentine's Day gifts as if to appear normal. I know, I know. And then left the house, parked his car at the local park, Robinson Park, and then made a dash for the house via the woods. And it is there that Nathan uh, allegedly told David that he waited in a closet for Denise to get home. And when she got home, the two had words, and then he shot her in the left side of her head with his 40 Glock. Now, he also told David that he had done some research on how he was going to kill Denise, all right? He put some thought into this. Now, at first, he thought he was going to, like, poison her with, like, like potassium or something, but then he decided he was going to do his trusty old Glock, and he told David that he had to look up how to silence it. Yeah, not looking good. It's pretty damning testimony so far, right? He also told David that he had purposely made sure to be seen by several security cameras, thus establishing an alibi. And he also told David that he changed out of the black hoodie that he had been wearing um, because he he was scared that he'd been seen by a neighbor that day. And so he quickly discarded his hoodie and changed clothes. Although not discarding it very well because it was found in the closet. But Nathan's not exactly the brightest here, is he? And get this, get this. It is David who said that it was Nathan who told him he had killed Denise as a Valentine's Day present for his girlfriend. Yeah, that's what uh, David is testifying to here. And interestingly enough, Nathan's attorney, Toner, he declined to cross-examine David. So yeah, I I don't know if his testimony was just that damning. Don't know, but he uh, declined to cross-examine him. And it turns out Nathan, um, he was right to be nervous and to to worry that he had been seen that day. Because he was. He was seen by a neighbor. And you guessed it, that neighbor was brought in as a witness. This neighbor was named Diane Parrish. She lived about a block away from the Luthholds, her and her husband. And she testified that on the day of the murder, she saw a, quote, scruffy-looking Nathan Luthold in a black sweatshirt slash hoodie walking away from Robinson Park. So uh, Diane and her husband had just left their house and she saw this strange figure kind of walking in the road and, you know, the way he was dressed, like it was just, it was just weird. And it, you know, most people worked out either before or after work. And so she thought it was weird to see someone like, you know, dressed like this in the middle of the road at that time of the day. Diane said she remembers this because her and her uh, husband were driving down their car. They had just left their house. They see this weird figure. And Diane was kind of worrying that this guy might, like, rob their house because he had just seen them, you know, leaving their house. So he knew it was unoccupied. And so she told her husband to slow down so she could get a good look at this guy. She wanted a good look at him. And uh, she testified that it was Nathan Luthold looking uncharacteristically disheveled and scruffy. Later in the day, after police had swarmed the area and news of Denise's murder got around, that's when Diane called the police and told her what she had seen that day. And she also um, identified Nathan from a photo lineup as the man she had seen that day in the black hoodie. Yet another piece of evidence that the prosecution presented. Now, this one was a doozy. It was a handwritten letter by Denise herself. It was found in the couple's bedroom in a day planner, and in it, Denise really lets loose. She really lets loose. Let's loose. Goodness. And you really get a sense of how Denise was feeling throughout this. You really get a good state into, um, a good insight into the state of their marriage, what she was thinking, how she was feeling. And it was uh, almost two sides of a uh, notebook sized piece of paper. And I do want to read a good chunk of it um, for you because, again, 
I do really deep dives in crime cases. I have to know every detail I can. And I just feel that it really, again, gives you an insight as to what, you know, poor Denise was going through during all of this, you know? So I will be looking down because, again, it's, 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 it's a few sentences. And again, I just wanted to share it with you because I think it gives an interesting insight. And I'm just a curious cat like that, you know? So it starts off as... What on earth could you possibly be thinking? I can't imagine anything you could say that would hurt worse than what you are doing to me now every day. I really don't think there's anything I have done or not done that would cause me to deserve this. I have tried to please you for 17 years and never succeeded. I've never been good enough. I've never done enough. I know that you want me dead. I am not stupid. I suppose it will confirm my worthlessness to you when I write that I am not brave enough to do that job for you. And now all of a sudden you, you are taking me with you places. What is that all about? Maybe you think I don't feel bad enough. You act like you are somehow noble because you refuse to tell me why you are doing this to me. It makes me sick. I have been willing at any time to fall in love with you, but you reject me every time. I wish I could hate you. I tried to hate you because I thought it would make it easier. I thought it wouldn't hurt so bad. Of course, I couldn't do it. So I have failed at that, too. I have been without pride. I have humiliated myself to try to win something that belongs to me. You defraud me and you don't seem to care. Well, I quit. I'm not going to try to please you anymore. I will do what I have to do, but no more of that game. You want to humiliate me by running around with a 20-year-old? Fine. I won't grovel. If I haven't pleased you in 17 years, nothing I do now will please you. And I refuse to leave my children just because you have decided to do this to me. You are the only person who thinks I am a bad mother. Complete strangers compliment me on them. So I will not join you in your obsession with perfection. I am the same person that I have always been. I am not weaker and in many ways stronger. I refuse to play to your perfectionism in that too I have borne neglect and criticism and kept going. But now this, how long? How long are you going to do this to me? Oh yeah, until I break. That's what you said, isn't it? Well, happy waiting. And I just thought that was really, I like, that's what Denise was going through. And yeah, I forgot to mention earlier, like Denise was really complimented on her, her mothering skills. Like it is said that the Luthold residence was like never in shambles. It was always clean and organized. The children were well behaved and obedient. Like Denise was a hands-on mother. She even homeschooled the kids. So yeah, I just thought that was a very interesting insight into poor Denise niece and what she's going through. I can't imagine going through even a quarter of this. I, I really can't. Like, it's just, it, it's terrible. Now, when it was time for the defense to present their argument, so that was all the evidence the prosecution had, again, circumstantial, but I don't know, man, pretty damning, pretty damning, especially with Diane's testimony about seeing Nathan and the inmates' testimony. I don't know. And, and then Denise, Denise's uh, note on top of that, like, I don't know, that was pretty damning. Now, Nathan's defense relied entirely on what he'd been saying from the beginning, that it was a break-in. Now, Nathan was originally going to take the stand in his own defense, but at the last minute, he decided not to. Um, he said that the prosecution was already, quote, muddying the waters, and he didn't want to give them any more ammunition. And so, yeah, he didn't want to uh, testify. Again, they reiterated that they believed Denise was killed by a robber in the commission of a robbery. They claimed the police never looked anywhere but at Nathan because it was found out later on that like cops had zeroed in on him like mere hours after the investigation began. And uh, a lot of the defense's witnesses really were just kind of police officers and trying to poke holes in their testimony. The defense even tried to link Denise's murder with a string of robberies that were uh, occurred in Peora. And uh, they even tried to say that Nathan looked like the ringleader of those crimes, Perry Rosado. And yeah, that's what they were trying to claim. However, however, the jury never even got to hear that argument because Judge Lyons like threw it out. He was like, these robberies happened after her death. 
um, in these robberies. No one was murdered. It just it just doesn't add up. So they weren't even allowed to present that uh, argument to the jury. Nathan's defense also tried to say that Denise's note, uh, though damning, it wasn't what it seemed. Okay, it wasn't what that seemed. Um, it was just, you know, someone someone writing stuff out. And that uh, if Denise was really that miserable or feared for her life, why wouldn't she confide in her closest confidants? Because I think it was discovered that not a lot of people were aware of, like, the Luthold marriage dynamics going on. And, yeah, that's what they were trying to prove. But, again, it's, like... You know, there's a lot of people that don't want to share what's going on behind closed doors when it comes to their relationships, even with their most close, trusted loved ones. So I personally thought that was kind of a flimsy argument because that note is damning. So after nearly six days, approximately 40 witnesses and two hours of closing arguments, get this, the jury took 90 minutes just 90 minutes to find Nathan Luthold guilty on all charges. And the courtroom was actually pretty empty. There was almost nobody in the courtroom because uh, no one really expected the jury to come back within an hour and a half. I'm not even sure if someone, I'm not even sure if people thought uh, a verdict was going to be read that day because like they thought it was going to be, you know, more of a, a debate. And uh, when the jury, uh, right before they filed out, uh, it is said that there was laughter in the jury room. So yeah, I guess they were pretty confident in their, in their verdict, I guess. Now, after the verdict was wet, read, uh, Nathan's parents booked it out of the courtroom, didn't talk to anyone. And, uh, his attorney, Hugh Toner, um, he had a statement, which I thought was just a little on, a little on. So, uh, after the verdict was read, his statement was said, uh, quote, obviously we're a bit disappointed in the verdict. A bit? It makes absolutely no sense to me that you would stage a burglary and say that I don't want to do anything to harm my in-law's furniture, but in their house, I am willing to kill their daughter. Which I thought was a weird statement. Like, okay. Like, he really, like, zeroed in on the fact that, like, the kitchen table was neat and orderly and the furniture was, for the most part, neat and orderly as to, like, I don't know why (laughs) his attorney thought that proved his, his innocence, but whatever. So Nathan was facing 45 years to life in prison. And at his sentencing, his attorney, of course, argued that he should get the minimum because he didn't have a prior criminal record. And get this, get this. His attorney even said that the prosecution had not proven that he and Ina were in a romantic relationship. To which, when he said this, Judge Lyons literally blurted out, really? Really? Like, he literally blurted that out when uh, Toner said that, which I just, I couldn't believe. Really, we didn't prove that he was screwing Ina. I think we proved that beyond a reasonable doubt. Like, I'm sorry. Maybe I'm just speaking for myself, but uh, Jeff would never be emailing or texting that kind of stuff. And he wouldn't be doing all of this awesome, fun stuff, like, with some other chick and not me, you know? You know? So I just thought that was really funny, so I I wanted to bring it up. Uh, His attorney also tried to argue that uh, Nathan should get the minimum because any sentence that Nathan got was pretty much going to be a life sentence because apparently in the state of Illinois for murder convictions, you have to serve 100% of your prison sentence before you're released. So yeah, Uh, Nathan ended up being sentenced to 80 years. Yeah, 80 years. And in his 26 minute long sentencing speech, Judge Lyons just pretty much went off on Nathan, uh, called him a quote thief for taking his children's mother uh, away from them. Uh, He said, quote, I have to give you credit. You have led a law abiding life. And for many years, you did good things, but you have poisoned it all. I personally would think uh, grooming and seducing a six-year-old is not exactly law-abiding, but uh, maybe I'm just maybe I'm just being a, a bitch. He continued, "You will end your life in a cold and gray and isolated Illinois penitentiary. Well, you will be more of a number than a name. You will be leaving this county to become more of a nobody and less of a somebody." Which, yeah, like, some of these judges in their, like, sentencing speeches, they really, like, they really go out. I was like, there's just, like, a bunch of birds. Nathan is currently serving his 80-year sentence at Menard Correctional Facility in Illinois. And, fun fact, he's actually listed on the prison's Wikipedia page among their more infamous prisoners. Yeah. 
Now, uh, just real quick, in February of 2015, Nathan's parental rights were officially revoked by the courts. Yeah, he had tried to argue that it was in his children's best interests that he remain their, uh, their parental figure, like still retain parental rights. But a court disagreed, and they granted full parental rights and custody to Denise's parents, uh, Diane and Doug Newton. They had been caring for the children since Nathan had been arrested in March of 2013. And even sad. So I watched a press conference with the Newtons after the verdict was read, and it was really sad. So they were talking about how they were talking to the children about what had happened. Uh, remember, Seth is about 12, Julie is about 10, and Janelle is about four. They're all probably about a year or two older from that um, at this point because the trial's over with. And they didn't tell the little one, Janelle, because she was too young. But, you know, the the two older ones were told, you know, they understood that their father had been accused of killing their mother and had been convicted of that. And this was just so sad. They said that Seth had said something along the lines of, um, well, you know, everyone makes mistakes when he was told that, you know, Nathan was pretty much going to go away the rest of his life. And that's when Doug said, no, your dad made bad choices. Everyone has choices in life and your dad made some really bad ones. Oh, that's just so sad. I really hope those kids get the, the therapy and the help they need. It's just really sad. In December of 2016, uh, Nathan's appeal was rejected by a trio of appellate judges with the third district appellate court in Ottawa in a 54 page order. And yes, that order is found online. And yes, I did find it and read all of it. In the 54 page order, the judges smacked down all of Nathan's claims. Um, he had about 11 claims um, and said that his appeal was out without merit. Most of his claims dealt with like statements made by himself or the prosecution and whether it should have been admitted. He also tried to argue that it was, quote, legally improper for Denise's note to be uh, administered in the trial. And yeah, the judges rejected all of it. Uh, they really, really focused in on the uh, forensic search that had been done on his laptop in those internet searches, specifically the one about silencing the 40 Glock. Like, to them, that... It seemed like to them that really seemed to prove to them that Nathan was in fact guilty of this murder and his sentence was upheld and everything was kosher. And so they sent him back to prison. Yeah. Yeah. Screw you, loser. And just super quick before we drop it for today, what happened to Ina, right? You're probably curious. Well, I don't know exactly what happened to her, just that she has since returned to Lithuania. Now... The local Lithuanian community, you know, that the Luthold's have been a part of, like their church community and the Lithuanian community over there in Lithuania, because of problems with their own corrupt criminal justice system over there, the general consensus over there is that Nathan's trial was uh, fake and corrupt and that judges and lawyers have been paid off and that he did not have a fair trial. There is some divide. Um, some people think that Nathan did seduce and groom six-year-old Ina and that she was just this young girl who fell in way over her head, while others don't think there was any romantic relationship between Nathan and Ina. I don't know how you look at the facts of this case and determine that, but okay. Okay. Yeah. But the, the main point of contention over there in the local Lithuanian community that the Luthholds were a part of seemed to be about the corruption of the trial. Yeah. And the church, the Marsh Baptist Church that the Luthholds were a part of, it is said that they were kind of reeling from this whole thing. Um, it really caused them to sort of like step back and analyze like, you know, what their re responsibility in all of this was because, you know, they had let this Lithuanian young girl go to this foreign country with this older guy and no one from the church had kept in contact with her. No one from the community, either in the U.S. or Lithuania, had checked in with her, seen how things were going. And yeah, it is said that the church was really reeling from that. Um, I know the pastor, remember Pastor David Sexton? It is said that uh, after the trial and the events of this case, like, yeah, the church was going to step back, kind of do some internal introspection and just kind of see how this could not happen again. You know, um, I would say probably stay in contact with your young congregants might be, you know, might be a way to start. 
but yeah, that is the pathetic tale of Nathan Luthold, the missionary who turned murderer. And yeah, uh, I was just so, I just had to get that off my chest because again, the the great hypocrisy involved in this case just gets me. Like when he was sentenced, Nathan invoked like God in scripture, maintained his innocence, and still maintained that he was a man of God. Like it, it it's just, it's pretty wild. It's pretty wild. And yeah. Um, yeah, this will be my last video for February. Can you believe it? February is over already. I will be back next month. I am super anxious to talk about next month's cases. I've been doing lots of research on them. So yeah, until next week, I hope you take care of yourself out there. Don't be a dick. Just please be decent. I know you can do it. I know you can do it. Just go out in public. Just be decent. All right. And yeah, I will see you next Tuesday for another crime dive. Bye-bye.